Dr. Dr. Elsa Rossignol, uh, who uh, I believe is really one of the pioneers in studying uh, how interneuron deficits uh, translate into cognitive deficits in epilepsy. Uh, Dr. Rossignol com completed her MD at McGill University and then went on to complete training uh, in pediatric neurology at the St. Justine Hospital. After fellowship training in neurogenetics, she went on to complete a postdoctoral fellowship in Gord Fischel's lab, where she showed that loss of voltage-gated calcium channels in cortical GABAergic interneurons cause uh, impaired GABAergic transmission and generalized epilepsy. Um, so this study really went against the grain, and uh, that's why I, lo I loved it so much, is all the previous work had implicated the thalamus and calcium channelopathies in the thalamus. But uh, this was really one of the first to go back to uh, cortex. Um, she's gone on to study how dendritic inhibition changes in these models. Um, and critically, she's since she is a pediatric neurologist and a neurogeneticist, uh, go back to humans and actually combine this work in work with humans with, uh, with epilepsy, autism, intellectual disability, um, and really be able to uh, sort of go back and forth between animal models and humans and, and look at phenotypes. Um, uh, and she's published multiple papers identifying uh, mutations in a number of key developmental genes in childhood epilepsies. Uh, her new work, uh, has expanded to examine the role of frontal disinhibition in cognitive deficits in these uh, animal models. Uh, she's won really numerous awards, including the CIHR Young Investigator Award uh, and the Junior Investigator Award, the Canada Research Chair, and, and, and a number of other awards. And she's really, uh, really my favorite person working in this space. Um, and. Uh, uh, really a great colleague. So here's uh, Elsa and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Feynman, for this uh, so very generous uh, uh, introduction and for this fantastic invitation to talk to you today. So I've enjoyed already exchanging with many of you this morning um, and please do interrupt if uh, you have questions along the road. So it's, it's a great pleasure to, um, to tell you a little bit of this longitudinal story that we've been building on the mechanisms of epilepsy uh, and cognitive impairment associated with the CACNA1A gene. Um, and so just as a start, I want to give you an insight on you know, this, uh, this diversity of, of diseases that are really um, uh, encompassed in this name of epilepsy, because we, we talk of epilepsy, but it's really multiple different diseases, both in terms of their clinical presentation, in terms of their etiologies and genetic um, really uh, triggers for some of these disorders. So um, just as a schematic representation, I, I always say, you know, that we recognize different types of syndromes of epilepsy. If we look at patients that don't have a lesion of the brain. Um, so of course, if you do pretty much any lesion of the brain, a tumor, a stroke, uh, you, you can develop epilepsy. But, uh, but in many patients, at least half of patients that we see, uh, there's really no history of any trauma or infection uh, or anoxia. Uh, and yet these children go on to have very severe epilepsies. And so we can recognize different types of seizure disorder depending on the type of seizures that patients present and their evolution over time. So there are you know, this large group of um, disorders that are called the generalized epilepsy disorders where patients will typically have a few different types of um, generalized seizures and generalized seizures are characterized when you do an EEG and you record brain activity by simultaneous um, uh, abnormal brain activity on both sides of the brain. And so usually patients will have an arrest of activity and a loss of consciousness at, at the beginning of a, of a generalized seizure. So amongst those, you have patients that will have absence seizures and some of them will have only absence seizures, either childhood or juvenile onset. Other patients will have absence that are these petit mal type of seizures and the grand mal type of seizures, the generalized tonic clonic seizures. Some of them will have myoclonus. And then in another group, you'll have a combination of all of these with uh, febrile seizures. 
most of patients with generalized uh, idiopathic or genetic epilepsies usually have a good prognosis um, uh, in terms of their cognitive impairment, although uh, development, although a subset of patients will have uh, cognitive impairment, learning disability, uh, ADHD associated with their epilepsy. Then there are the focal epilepsies and there are various types of seizure disorder where you'll typically have in one patient an onset of seizure in one brain area. So you have the occipital lobe epilepsy, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, or lambdic that is more central temporal. And then there's this big group of patients, which in number may be smaller, but really in their um, and the severity of the disease is, is a large preoccupation for pediatric neurologists and epileptologists. So those are the epileptic encephalopathies. And typically these kids will start having seizures uh, early on in the first few months of life. Some of them will start in the first few days of life. Um, and they will go on to have a variety of seizure types. So they can mix um, what we call atypical absence, so a little bit more prolonged, tonic seizures, myoclonic, atonic. Um, and most of these kids have developmental arrest with the onset of epilepsy and often a regression and uh, end up with um, important cognitive impairment, uh, intellectual deficiency in the long run. So my lab has been interested in understanding some of the genetic triggers for these different syndromes. Uh, and we've been really interested in the epileptic encephalopathies, but some of the genes we've been studying will cause either this type of disorder or this type, de depending on the type of mutations. So I will give you a little bit more insight on this. But just before, for those of you that are less familiar with epilepsy, I wanted to show you some videos so that you understand some of the seizure types that we're talking about and why and how different they are and why I think it's important to try to understand how these types of seizures actually occur. So these are videos taken from YouTube now that we cannot show patient derived videos um, uh, across the world. Uh, so this is a patient with an absence seizure. You'll see you can trigger them with hyperventilation and as he's breathing, at some point, he'll have an arrest of activity with blinking of the eyes, it's coming now, and some stereotypic movements of the mouth. And this is a brief absence, so it lasts a few seconds, and he'll, he comes back to normal after that. And these uh, children with absence seizures can have 60 to 100 of these episodes per day. Um, and then you have other types of disorders, so that the lennox gastaut syndrome, well, you have similar type of absence, but perhaps longer, which we call atypical. And then they'll have other types of seizures, such as the myoclonic, atonic um, episodes here, where she has a bit of a head drop. Um, these are a little bit asymmetric in this uh, particular patients. And at night, they tend to have episodes that are um, very, uh, prolonged stiffness uh, called tonic seizures and, and the more typical tonic clonic seizures, the gamma seizures. And so these kids, of course, um, you know, have a very severe epilepsy, are often refractory to therapies. And we've been interested in understanding how you get so, uh, so different, uh, um, you know, type of disorders in, in patients. And so, um, and even at the EEG level, you can see that an absence um, is very different from a tonic-clonic seizures where the absence has these very nice spike and wave discharges um, that start abruptly and abruptly after a, a few seconds. And the tonic-clonic seizures are quite different. You have these beta activity, then poly spikes, and eventually this alternation in the clonic phase of, of spikes and, and slow wave. And, um, uh, repression of the rhythm. Now we've been interested in trying to understand how some of these um, disorders occur in patients. So to do this, we've been recruiting basically all children um, referred to our center with epilepsy and cognitive impairment or what we call epileptic encephalopathy. We have more than a, a thousand families recruited up to now and we've been doing exome sequencing and then genome sequencing more recently in trios so on the child and the, and the two parents to try to pinpoint um, etiologies. And across the last 10 years, I think our ability to, to find causes for these children has really improved tremendously with these uh, new genetic tools. So we're now able to reach a diagnosis in about 50% of cases for whom we really had no idea a few years back. Um, and along the road, we've been studying many uh, new candidate genes that we've been identifying and that other groups also have been finding. And in this uh, recent paper where we have a few um, 
100 trios. We've also done a meta-analysis to, to see some of the recurrent genes that may be associated with epilepsy. And we have these 110 genes that are more often associated with epilepsy see in, in a large uh, cohort. And so some of these genes here are channels and some of them are involved with um, uh, synaptic release or the integrity of the synaptic um, uh, machinery. And one of these is a CACNA1A gene, which is what I'll be telling you more about today. So many years ago, actually, when I first started my lab, I was fortunate to meet these uh, families. So the the green dots here are patients that had the uh, generalized epilepsy. So most of these kids were referred for refractory ab ab uh, absence epilepsy, sometimes with occasional tonic-clonic seizures or focal seizures. And what was striking is that um, all, so the, about a third of the cohort had epilepsy, a third of the cohort only had febrile seizures, so they had seizures on fever. And all of these patients had some degree of cerebellar involvement, uh, which was actually mild, and most of the parents were never diagnosed with a cerebellar disorder. But when I was examining these kids, I noticed this downbeat nystagmus. So when the child looks down, you'll see its gaze evoked, uh, it's more pronounced looking down, and you see the eyes bobbing. Um, and so that's the downbeat nystagmus that we saw in all of these families, and including the parents that were carrier of the mutations. Um, and so the other striking aspect of the phenotype in these families were the, the, the level of cognitive impairment. So it really varied from one individual to the other in the cohort, but about a third of the children have autism spectrum disorders uh, with or without epilepsy. So these two kids had never had seizures, uh, but they have autism. Uh, and some of them had frank intellectual disability and others had more milder phenotype with ADHD learning disability. Most of the parents in this cohort that were carriers or affected individuals actually never held independent jobs. So they did have some um, you know, significant impact in terms of their, of their daily living. And when I was um, studying these uh, families, I identified various uh, point mutations um, or a full deletion of the gene. And these were uh, nonsense mutations. So you're expecting them to interrupt the, the gene. So either a, a stop gain here or a frame shift mutation. And so this gene uh, in which we found these four different nonsense mutations actually encodes the alpha-1 pore forming unit of the CAV2.1 calcium channel, um, as a PQ type calcium channel. And this is a channel that's important at uh, the uh, release site at uh, the nerve terminal for calcium entry and release of neurotransmitter, uh, um, uh, of neurotransmitters for vesicular fusion at the membrane. And so um, we've been interested in figuring out the mechanisms for the epilepsy and also the cognitive impairment associated with, um, with mutations of this gene. But I also want to tell you before that, that as we were moving on in our studies of patients with epilepsy, we also found a few patients with a severe uh, epileptic encephalopathy called the Lennox-Gastaut syndrome with the video that I showed you with the child that has really multiple types of seizures um, throughout the course of her life and eventually has uh, profound intellectual def uh, deficiency and in some of these kids actually had severe ataxia. Uh, and so these are the red um, uh, mutations here. They can, you can see they affect pretty much uh, every region of the gene. But it was striking that these patients were so severely affected when what they had was a missense mutation compared to the other patients that I showed you that had a truncating mutation. So that was uh, interesting and I wanted to know more about this. And just as I'm mentioning this, um, showing this picture, I want to point out that this gene has been more tradi traditionally associated with other disorders. So either isolated episodic um, ataxia here in blue, and these were traditionally shown to be loss of function mutations. And then there were the familial hemiplegic migraine in, in yellow, um, and they were thought to be allelic but unrelated disorders, and these were gain of function. So here we had these patients with global developmental delay, epilepsy, and point mutations. Um, and so we wanted to know how, um, you know, what the uh, functional impact of these mutations were. So what we did was to express some of these um, mutations in hex cells and then in, in uh, mouse neurons, knockout neurons. And we found something interesting is that um, with this severe spectrum of uh, lennox gastaut epilepsy, we actually found that half of the mutations we cloned um, had this peculiar mis, um, mis-targeting of the channel. And you can see that 
this is a membrane bound calcium channel, so it tends to be expressed at the surface. But in two of our mutants, you could really see an accumulation of the channel, the mutant channel in the cytoplasm. And we saw the same thing uh, using mouse neurons, and you can see that they're really accumulated here. And for these two mutations, when we were recording the currents, that, um, any currents we could get at the, uh, uh, in whole cell patch clamp mode, this is the, the wild type, but in those two uh, mutations, we actually found whatever uh, channel was expressed was conducting, but very uh, low conductance. So there, there was a loss of function, um, but the interesting part of this is that if you co-express the mutant and the wild type, you actually see a reduction also in the, in the wild type current, suggesting that there's a dominant negative impact here. So that's probably why these patients that have these dominant negative mutations are so much more severe clinically than the patients that have haploinsufficiency and the full deletion of only one copy of the gene. So this looks almost more like a homozygous, not, not really, but it's dominant negative. Now, the other two mutations we had actually had the opposite uh, functional impact, and we saw a clear gain of function in terms of the, the, um, the current, but also the gating properties. Um, and with this particular mutation was next to another hemiplegic migraine mutation. And compared to the familial hemiplegic migraine that was also a gain of function, this epilepsy mutation had much more striking effect in, <clears throat> on the gating of the channel and the channel tended to uh, remain open much longer. So ultimately the, the effect was, was uh, exponentially uh, increased. For these gain of function mutation, we, we could actually um, uh, uh, with 3D modeling, we could actually predict a structural impact on uh, the mobility of, of some of the loops of the channel and that would explain gating deficits uh, in, these, in these channels. So basically up to now what I've shown you is that with a few studies, we've shown that CACNA1A is actually an important cause of epilepsy. And we now know that in cohorts of patients with epileptic encephalopathy is about 1% of patients that have a mutation in this gene. And in cohorts of patients with autism, it's also about 1%. So it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's an important number of patients um, uh, uh, it's, it's a gene that will cause epilepsy and various types of mutations will cause different types of, of, of seizure disorder and of cognitive impairment. So in the rest of the talk, I'll be telling you a bit more about our mechanistic work to try to understand how loss of function, either haploinsufficiency or homozygous loss of function affects uh, brain networks and how this can lead to epilepsy. And just as a an illustration of our, our, our thought about these, uh, this gene is that you, if you have this kind of a balance, um, it, uh, when you have a loss of function, a missense loss of function, you typically get an episodic ataxia phenotype. If you, get, if you have a nonsense uh, haploinsufficiency, you get these generalized epilepsy with mild to moderate intellectual deficiency and some level of episodic ataxia. And the dominant negative one will give you the more severe epilepsies with lennox gastaut type seizures. And then you have the missense mutation with gain of function that will cause the hemiplegic migraine and the more severe uh, impact uh, functionally of gain of function will give you lennox gastaut So today I'll be telling you more about these. Um, uh, we have a model now that we've generated with CRISPR for this lennox gastaut mutation and we'll tell you more in a few years perhaps, but for today we'll focus on the loss of function. So we were uh, really interested in the generalized epilepsy um, in, these, uh, in these mutants. And so as uh, Piment said earlier in the introduction, my interest has been on these, uh, the network mechanisms of these absence seizures. Um, and uh, uh, what we know from uh, decades of animal work is that absence seizures, these nice spike wave uh, at the surface are actually a, a, a reflection of hypersynchronous thalamocortical discharges. And there are many circumstances where genetic mutations that selectively affect the excitability of the thalamus um, are sufficient to trigger spike wave seizures. And often in these models, the spike wave seizures will be isolated and they, there's very little motor seizures. Now, what I was interested in is in our model where we have uh, in our, our gene where we have a lot of these other types of seizures could an impairment of inhibition in the cortex actually contribute to, to the seizure phenotype. 
And so inhibition in, in the cortex or other brain structure is not uniform. There are various types of uh, inhibitory neurons. And you know, uh, with experts in the field, of course, in, in, in your group, um, that interneurons uh, originate in different structures. And the MGE neurons include the PV, fast spiking back basket cells, and the somatostatin uh, uh, positive uh, neurons that include the Martinotti cells. And I'll be focusing on those today, mostly because early on in, in the first study, we showed that um, this cacna one a gene is largely expressed in most MG neurons and in a very small minority of CG neurons. So we really were interested in those. And as a reminder, the, the basket cells, the PV, will mostly target the, the soma of, uh, pyramidal cells, whereas somatostatin neurons have various connectivity, of, of, of course, but some of them are Martinotti cells and they will really target the dendrites. So these are different types of inhibition. So what we did early on was to, to generate conditional mutants uh, where, we, um, where we deleted the gene in MGE neurons using the NKX 2.1 Cree driver. So these are both PV and somatostatin neurons. And in those animals, we saw a very early onset uh, generalized epilepsy in the mouse where we had many different types of seizures. We had clear tonic-clonic seizures. We had also prolonged episodes of freezing and the EG looked more like very fast spikes, uh, spike wave activity. And then we had episodes of tonic seizures where the animal just becomes very stiff. Uh, and interestingly, at the time I had said that this may be a, a lennox gastaut uh, uh, syndrome mouse. And of course, at the time I was told that it was impossible because the gene was not yet associated with epilepsy in humans. But now we know that it, it actually does cause this type of various um, very complex seizure disorder in humans as well. So in any case, removing the gene in interneurons was sufficient to cause epilepsy. And in that first paper, we showed selective dysfunction of um, synaptic release from parvobimin interneurons. In these models, the neurons migrate normally, they're expressing their uh, markers normally, they do develop uh, quite uh, well in the proper layers and they connect well but they have a deficit in their ability to release neurotransmitters. So if in paired recordings in deep layers of the cortex, when you stimulate the fast packing basket cells, we record a very nice response in the pyramidal cell. But in our mutant, we had much less responses. So uh, a reduction, uh, higher failure rates. And when we did get responses, they were smaller and jittery. So that were delayed compared to the stimulus. Now we looked at the other population, the somatostatin neurons, and for this we did a trick where we used the somatostatin Cre um, uh, to remove the gene only in somatostatin cells. These animals did not have epilepsy. Um, they seemed quite well, um, and functionally we showed that there was a, a preservation of their synaptic release, mostly because of a switch of channel from PQ to N-type channel, so you can see whatever transmission now can be blocked with, con um, with conotoxin. And, um, and so I must point out that in most neuronal cell types that we've studied, you see the switch of PQ to N-type channel. So there is some kind of functional compensation, but in some cell types, this compensation is not enough to, um, to, uh, to revert the functional effect on, on specific cell types. So it's not enough to, uh, to, uh, to rescue the phenotype at the cellular level for PV cells, but it is for some of the step in neurons. Now, going back to this um, NKX mutant, what we showed, we went on to look at the thalamus and we showed in this model that there was no change in the excitability of the thalamus. Um, so that really the cortical, lack of cortical inhibition or reduced cortical inhibition was probably the trigger for the seizures we were observing. Now, we also did a cross where we removed the gene only in pyramidal cells, the EMX1 Cre. And in those animals, once again, we didn't see any seizures, but what we saw was a reduction of cortical excitability. Um, and so uh, in these animals, um, there is an impact on the synaptic release also of pyramidal cells, but it's not enough to trigger seizures. However, if you cross both lines, so you basically remove the gene in pyramidal cells and in NKX interneurons, then we changed the phenotype. And so we kind of abolished the, the prolonged motor seizures. We saw brief ep episodes um, of uh, discharges that looked like absence seizures with um, a lack of uh, EMG activity here and some episodes of myoclonus. Um, and so there is some kind of network uh, balance uh, that, uh, that occurs uh, when you do this dual mutation, uh, but the deficit in inhibition is still present and is still sufficient to trigger seizures. <laughs> 
Now, in, uh, in the last few years, we've been interested in, in uh, digging more in this uh, impact on various uh, populations of neurons. And in the lab here, Alexis Lucamayar is a PhD student who's just um, graduating this month. And Xiao is a postdoc uh, who now has a lab uh, in China that was working on this project at the time. And so they asked a question, you know, we wanted to know how much of this phenotype was actually early developmental, meaning that, uh, you know, could this be rescued somehow? If there's still some impact postnatally, then perhaps there is a window where we can still intervene, even though this uh, disorder occurs early. Um, and as we're doing this project, we also found some new answers regarding uh, ways of perhaps regulating motor seizures. And so in this study, what they did was to compare the NKX cream mutant that I showed you with the PV cream mutant. And PV is a little bit complicated because it does get expressed in the cortex, uh, in interneurons in the cortex, but with some delay. So it starts around P14 and by P30, most neurons, PV interneurons are recombined in this line. But interestingly, it's also recombining the nuclear, uh, reticular nucleus of the thalamus early on, as well as the cerebellum. But still, this was a way of, for the cortical neurons uh, of doing a mutation that was delayed after birth. And so when we looked at this mutant, uh, we saw a majority of absence seizures. So compared to NKX mutant that have these very long um, and more abundant motor seizures, uh, the PV cream mutant mostly has absence and with occasional tonic-clonic seizures. So the frequency of the absence was more, much greater than in the NKX mutant. Um, and they had less of these motor seizures. So they had a milder phenotype. Um, and so we wondered initially perhaps uh, that the recombination with using the PV Cree in the reticular nucleus somehow um, changed the way that the activity was, uh, was being synchronized and that perhaps this was favoring absence seizures. Um, and so to ask this question, what we did was actually to combine both Cree lines so effectively removing here in MGE-derived interneurons uh, from embryonic ages, but we're also removing the, NRT in the, the gene in the NRT of the thalamus um, from birth. And so these animals actually are very similar to the NKX, suggesting um, so they have frequent motor seizures and very infrequent absence seizures. So that suggests that the reason why we have these um, predominance of absence seizures in the PVQ model is not due to the recombination of the thalamus, but is really due to something else and most likely to the delay of the mutation uh, uh, that occurs a little bit uh, after birth uh, in these mutants. And so then we thought perhaps the PV cells are actually better able to compensate if you remove the gene later on uh, after birth. And so we checked this um, in this model uh, using a variety of, of approaches, but the first thing is that we looked at the number of synapses that these cells were making on the soma of pyramidal cells and deep uh, cortical layers. And we, you can see here a control and a mutant. We saw a reduction of, of perisomatic boutons in these mutants, both in the PV and the NKX cream mutants. So in a similar fashion, about 20% reduction. And in this PV mutant, we also found very similar uh, alteration in synaptic properties from these PV neurons. We have redu reduced probability of connections between PV and pyramidal cells. Uh, and whatever connection we get, uh, we, we saw smaller responses, a little bit more sluggish. So very similar to what we had found in the NKX mutant, suggesting that the PV cells are as affected uh, functionally in the PV cream mutant as in the NKX. However, what we observe uh, recording um, more generalized, more general um, uh, inhibitory tones, so using, using miniature iPSCs and spontaneous iPSCs in the cortex, we actually found an increase in events in these PV cream mutants, and this is in pyramidal cells, suggesting that even though the parvalbumin cells are dysfunctional, these cortexes are actually seeing more inhibitory events. So that probably uh, contributes to milder seizure phenotype. And we wanted to know where these events were coming from. So one of the possibility was uh, the other uh, major population in the group that we've been studying uh, was the somatostatin neuron. So we wanted to look at this. And the way we did this was to use a genetic trick to label somatostatin neurons with a transgene here, the gene GFP. 
uh, in the PV Creek Kaknawane mutant. So in this mutant, really the, the Kaknawane is removed only in PV cells, but we're labeling only the somatostatin neurons. And GIN, of course, will not re uh, label all somatostatin neurons. It's a subset of neurons, but it includes the Martina T cells, those that project to layer one and will target the, the dendrites of pyramidal cells. And what you can see from, uh, from far is that in these PV3 mutants, we have an increase of arborization or sprouting of these somatostatin neurons um, targeting the layer one uh, in the cortex. And with the zoom in here, you can see that there's really this um, exuberant uh, proliferation of, of neurites. And we also saw an increase in the number of boutons, GFP boutons and, and gefferin positive boutons, uh, VGAT positive boutons. And so this increase in sprouting was actually apparent even before seizure onset. So these animals usually start seizing around P45, but even from P30 on, we saw this sprouting and it persisted and increased uh, with age. And we saw this increase in, in, uh, in Vigat Bhutan as well. So we looked a little bit deeper to see the distribution of these boutons using two photon imaging and filling of uh, single neurons. Um, and we saw that, uh, that most of these uh, gene positive boutons were actually targeting the distal dendrites of, of pyramidal cells. Now to show whether these were actually functional synapses, we did paired recordings between somatostatin neurons and pyramidal cells. And once again, uh, in this model where the mutation is in the PV cream mod, uh, cells only, we found a major increase in connectivity between somatostatin neuron and pyramidal cells. So there is a gain of connectivity from somatostatin neuron to pyramidal cells in response to a reduction of inhibition from PV neurons. And so we wondered what would be triggering this sprouting or exuberant um, uh, re reorganization of the somatostatin neurons. And we thought that perhaps this is an activity uh, mediated effect. And so we did record spontaneous EPSCs in uh, somatostatin neurons. And there we go, we found a major increase in the frequency of these spontaneous uh, excitatory events in uh, somatostatin neurons, um, but not in parvodomin neurons and, and not in pyramidal cells. So it was really uh, the somatostatin neurons in these acute slices were the ones receiving the, the increased excitation. And one of the molecular pathway that could be activity regulated and drive sprouting of neurons, uh, you know, an obvious culprit was the mTOR pathway. So we looked at that. Um, and so we tried treating our animals with an mTOR blocker, so rapamycin. And you can see this is um, the mutant treated with vehicle, the mutant with rapamycin. And we gave the rapamycin for two weeks uh, before seizure onset. So um, that we're really dissociating uh, both uh, the, the seizures and, and the network effect of the mutations. Um, and as we're blocking uh, this sprouting and many other things, of course, we know it's not a pure approach. We're putting rapamycin everywhere. Uh, but amongst the things that we're affecting is the sprouting. And so we do um, block it back to wild type level. But now you still have the parvobumin cell dysfunction. And in this model, if you block the sprouting, you actually increase the seizure um, frequency. And now these seizures are mostly motor seizures. So you have a major increase of the motor seizures in these uh, mutants were um, uh, treated with uh, uh, rapamycin. So this suggests that perhaps output of somatostatin neurons is sufficient to, to modulate the, the seizure phenotype that we observe. And another way of looking at it was to trigger seizures, motor seizures in another fashion. So acutely with kinetic injections, you can get motor seizures in most animals. Um, so this is a resin scale and three and above is, is there is some motor component to the seizures. And so what we did in this paradigm is that we used a somatostatin Cree. These are wild type animals, so there's no Kaknawane mutation here. It's really just somatostatin. And we used dreads that we injected in the cortex in six different areas in the somatosensory cortex, but bilaterally. Um, and so we implanted EEG so we can monitor the seizures. And on the first day of the experiments, uh, when you inject the kinetic acid, you see the spectrum of severity of uh, seizures. And the next day, if we give CNO, so to activate the dread, so here we're activating only somatostatin neurons 30 minutes before kinetic acid, you see that you block the motor seizures. 
So indeed, it seems that in the cortex output, uh, acute uh, stimulation of somatostatin neurons is sufficient to block motor seizures. This is not long lasting, unfortunately. So two days later, if you repeat this, you actually have a rebound. So uh, it may not be translational at the moment, but it was still very interesting for us because motor seizures are really what um, the type of seizures that are associated with SUDEP and, and death in epilepsy. So anything that we learn about the mechanisms of one type versus the other of, uh, type of seizure is, is interesting for us. And so in this first um, you know, section of the talk, what I basically showed you was um, this kakna one mutation uh, uh, in um, interneurons uh, embryonically or in parvodomin uh, interneurons. When you do it in embryonically in both cell types, you actually affect the synaptic output from PV neurons. Somatostatin neurons seem to compensate their function. Now, if you do the same thing, but later on, you also have a reduction in synaptic output from PV interneurons. Uh, however, in this model, you get a progressive gain of somatostatin uh, sprouting and uh, sending um, synaptic boutons on the dendrites of pyramidal cells. And this is largely through um, uh, activity regulation and increased excitatory uh, input from pyramidal cells to these somatostatin cells. This is mTOR regulated. Um, and so another point here that I'd like to make is that a few years ago in the field of epilepsy, there was a lot of interest um, with mTOR and people were thinking, ah, we should start giving mTOR blockers to anybody that has severe epilepsy because, you know, mTOR is everywhere and it's important uh, as a trigger for epilepsy because we know that a gain of mTOR activity like in tuberous sclerosis gives um, a significant cognitive impairment and epilepsy. Now, what this study shows is that you know, there are some compensatory mechanisms that occur within the networks um, and perhaps, uh, you know, using mTOR blockers in situations where this is not the primary cause for the epilepsy um, may not be the right way to go. So this is a side uh, comment that I had um, on, on this topic. But basically here we had evidence of the role of these, uh, of this cacna one gene in different neurons and how uh, sprouting of somatostatin neurons may control um, uh, the output in terms of seizures. Now, the last uh, part of the talk, I want to focus on the cognitive impairment, which has been really an interest for us um, over the last uh, six years now. And uh, once again, it's Alexi, PhD student uh, who conducted most of this work with some help from Xiao for the electrophysiology. And uh, this paper actually just got accepted today. So I can now uh, say that it's in press um, out of uh, uh, an hour ago. And so in this paper, what we wanted to know was to characterize a little bit better the cognitive impairment in these patients and the mechanisms underlying uh, some of this impairment. And so doing uh, neuropsychological evaluations of these, this first cohort of patients with uh, nonsense mutations in the gene, we could uh, you know, demonstrate that there was a reduction in, I, in general IQ uh, in these patients with some impact on working memory and verbal comprehension and uh, important impact on, uh, on attention and um, various abilities for learning. Um, and these patients that were tested were actually already on psychostimulants. So this uh, probably uh, improved their executive function, but you can see that they're, um, they're functioning less well than the norm, although it doesn't reach the threshold of minus two. Now, with finer uh, detailed analysis, we could find various impairment in what we call selective attention. So that's the ability to pay attention to one stimulus and ignore another type of stimulus that is not uh, relevant at, uh, for a specific task, um, as well as some impact on motor coordination and some reduction uh, in the flexibility, although this once again didn't reach significance in these patients that were treated. So we were interested in, in studying these various aspects, once again, using animal models. And this time we went back to the heterozygous mutants. Um, and so we looked at brain areas, which I thought were important for these, uh, for these functions. So selective attention and cognitive rigidity uh, are associated with uh, various areas of the frontal cortex. So we looked at the medial prefrontal cortex that's important for attention and orbitofrontal cortex for um, cognitive uh, flexibility. Uh, and in both areas, we could find a reduction of uh, synaptic output from PV neurons using optogenetic um, and slice experiments. And also dual recordings, we saw similar uh, 
impairments in terms of synaptic release from these uh, from these PV neurons in, in the frontal cortex. So meaning that even the heterozygous condition have a clear impact on synaptic release from PV neurons. Now these animals do not have spontaneous seizures, which made them a good model to study cognition because you don't want to have uh, epilepsy all over the place when you're doing cognitive tasks in, in mice, but they do have a reduced um, uh, seizure threshold, meaning they're more sensitive uh, to uh, uh, triggers, to triggering seizures here with PTZ. Now doing a battery of behavioral tests, we found a few um, uh, markers of, of cognitive and behavioral uh, disturbances in these animals. So most prominently, we found uh, evidence of what we call reduced anxiety or perhaps some impulsivity in these animals where they're not afraid of the center zone of the open field. So they'll go in the center much more than, than controls will. And we have the same effect in the elevated plasmas where they explore the open arms more than what controls normally do. These animals also have some sociability deficit um, where uh, usually uh, wild type mice will prefer interacting with a mouse than with an empty chamber, but in our mutants, they actually prefer the reverse. However, they don't have an impairment in the novelty seeking, so that's more lateral and uh, temporal, and they, they behave as a wild type mice preferring uh, uh, old, uh, new mice to their old mice. Now we wanted to dig deeper in these uh, cognitive rigidity and selective attention uh, function. And so what we've designed here was adapted test that has been used uh, in my, uh, humans uh, as well as in rats, but not frequently in mice uh, for various aspects of, of selective attention. Um, and as a graphic representation where we're asking of the mice is to find a well where there's food and there's two types of stimulus. There's a texture of the pellets as well as an odor. And the animal needs to start paying attention to one selective type of stimulus, for instance, the texture. Uh, and you will change the pairing of textures and odor until they always find a new rule. And so you can change the rule here, but it's always paying attention to the texture. So they learn to avoid paying attention to the odor. And at the end, you do the extra dimensional shift and that's when they need to pay attention to the odor. And I reassure, I reassure you, they don't have an uh, olfactive deficit. We tested it. So they're able to uh, finally discriminate different odors but they really do have a deficit in this extra dimensional shift when you ask them to change the focus of their attention compared to um, wild type animals. The other thing is that in terms of cognitive flexibility, uh, although spatial learning in the water maze was preserved in these animals, so they are able to find the platform pretty well, but when you change the rule, this reversal learning is quite hard for them. So it's very difficult for the mice to learn a new rule. They'll tend to explore the old uh, area uh, uh, instead of finding the new platform. Um, and so we did another test for selective for reversal learning uh, as well. And in this test, that's a probabilistic learning test. So there's going to be food in one of the wells 80% uh, of the time, and the animal needs to find which well it is and has to go there for eight, uh, six times in a row. And the next day you do the same test, but you reverse the rule. Now it's going to be on the other side. And our animals are really, once again, deficient in reversal learning in this test. And they do a lot of regressive error and they switch, they switch back to the old rule, even though they're, um, it's mistaken. So this, um, we'll use this test again later in the talk, but um, in this, you know, first part of this paper, we show that there's clear, you know, um, cognitive uh, and behavioral uh, deficits in these animals that do recapitulate some of the selective attention, perhaps impulsivity and uh, cognitive rigidity that we saw also in humans. Now we did the uh, all the same experiments now in the AMX1 Cree, meaning that we're removing the gene only in pyramidal cells. And once again, these are heads. And these animals in all of this behavioral tests had no deficit that we could observe in these uh, selective tests that I've just shown you. And functionally, when we looked at cortical excitability in these um, mice, we could not find a deficit in the EMX uh, 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 heterozygous. So compared to the homozygous, where there is an impairment of both cell types in the heterozygous condition, which recapitulates a lot of what uh, we see in patients, it seems to be more of an interneuron uh, selective deficit. 
And so with this in mind, we could then go back and probe different parts of the circuit. So we did um, selective deletion of the gene in specific parts of the frontal cortex. So using an AV29 uh, Cree injection in the heterozygous uh, flux allele, uh, we could do a deletion only in the, for instance, here in the medial prefrontal cortex. And with these animals, we saw that they uh, now had a, um, a deficit in selective attention and they had no deficit in the other tasks that I showed you before. So this was really specific to the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, and we did the same for the orbital frontal cortex. And once again, in these, we saw a deficit in the reversal learning, but not in the selective attention that task. And in the reversal learning in both paradigms that we use, so we had this deficit here in reversal as well. So this is really region specific, these two um, uh, um, aspects of the phenotype, if you will. So then we uh, went uh, and played around with targeted stimulation of neurons uh, in these uh, original PV Cree mutants. Um, and in those, what we did now was to use the, the dread um, to activate the PV neurons. Um, and so either uh, the red here are the mutants that have only the AVM cherry and the blue are the mutants that have the dread. And so you can see that at baseline, both mutants will have a hard time with the uh, selective attention uh, task. And this was in the medial prefrontal cortex here. Now, if you repeat the test uh, two days later, now with uh, CNO uh, just before doing the task, you can rescue the mutants that express the dread, but not the mutants that express the M-cherry. And this doesn't last. So if you repeat that a few days later, they're back to their mutant state. So selective activation of PV cells in the medial prefrontal cortex will rescue the selective attention deficit. And we did the same thing now with for the reversal learning and now injecting the uh, um, dread in the OFC. And we found here again that we could rescue, uh, these are the mutants that are rescued uh, back to the control level for the reversal um, for the reversal task, uh, as well as for um, all of the uh, errors that they used to perform. So basically what I've shown you today is that Kaknawa A mutations cause a variety of epilepsy uh, disorders um, uh, that depend on the functional impact of specific mutations. And there's a spectrum uh, with uh, other aspects of the phenotype for the ataxia uh, mostly. And that I've shown you that PD interneurons are particularly sensitive to the loss of cacna one a and CAV2.1 uh, function, and that it seems sufficient uh, to induce generalized seizures uh, when you uh, remove the gene in PV neurons. Now, in uh, the PV cream mutant that I've shown you, a progressive gain of, of uh, dendritic inhibition from sprouting of somatostatin neurons occurs with time and it prevents progressively motor seizure. That's kind of interesting because we see something similar in patients. Often patients with epilepsy, uh, the, the seizure phenotype will change with age and it's not uncommon to see a little bit less motor seizures with time. Uh, so this may be some of the mechanism that perhaps we could eventually tr start to um, recruit earlier in the, in the disease um, progress. Now, um, the last part of the talk, I showed you how uh, this gene is also important for the function of PV neurons in the frontal cortex and specific subcircuits that are important for cognitive rigidity and selective attention, and that these deficits can be rescued by targeted activation uh, of, of these neurons. So I'd like to um, once again acknowledge everybody in the lab who's done the fantastic work uh, that I've shown you. We're very proud of Alexi who's uh, moving on and uh, starting to look for a postdoc. Um, and uh, I want to thank my collaborators, so Jean-Claude Lacaille, uh, with whom we've collaborated for most of the uh, patch uh, physiology, Jacques Michaud, my collaborator in genetics, um, uh, Roberto for uh, some of the imaging of dendrites, and Gord with whom I started this uh, whole journey and the funding uh, agencies. So welcome your questions. <laughs>